Thank you, Dr. Washington. Our uh, next speaker is coming to us today from uh, Atlanta, Georgia. This is Dr. Anya Kelly from Emory University, who is going to review for us the plural space. Hello, my name is Anya Kelly, and today's talk is on chest X-ray observation skills, the plural space. This is my disclosure. So today we're going to evaluate the pleura using chest radiography. We will distinguish pleural disease from pulmonary disease on chest radiography. We will become familiar with the radiographic imaging appearances of pleural diseases, at the same time applying physics principles in assessing fluid and ill in the pleural space. Chest radiography is useful to evaluate the pleura compared to the mediastinum where CT and MRI are more useful. We need to be able to distinguish pleural disease from lung parenchymal disease in order to narrow the differential diagnosis. Pleural disease signs include angle, epicenter, shape, margins, and associated features. One of the rules that we use to determine if something is arising in the lung or outside the lung is the epicenter rule. Extraparenchymal is a word for outside the lung, chest, or pleura. So here's three lesions in this diagram. The uppermost lesion here has obtuse or large angles with the chest wall, indicating that it's extraparenchymal arising from the chest wall or pleura. The lesion on the bottom here makes an acute less than 90 degree angle with the chest wall, indicating that it arises in the lung. There are other features we look for as well, such as bone destruction, which often indicates chest wall lesion, and if you find air bronchograms, that'll indicate a known lesion. By using the epicenter rule, we draw a circle. We continue that from the lesion and then determine where the center of that lesion would be. So the uppermost lesion here has its epicenter outside of the lung in keeping with the chest wall or pleural lesion, whereas the lowermost lesion here has its epicenter in the lung, indicating it's a lung lesion. Unfortunately, however, we often end up in the middle here with a lesion that makes a 90 degree angle with the chest wall. And in that situation, if there are multiple lesions, I would try and characterize those, or I would look for features such as bone destruction or the presence of air bronchograms. Here's two chest radiographs. On the left, a patient with metastatic renal cell cancer and cannonball metastases. You'll notice that the largest lesion here makes an acute angle with the chest wall. The patient on the right has a solitary plasmacytoma in their left chest wall. And you'll notice that this makes an obtuse, large than 90 degree angle with the chest wall. Another feature of extraparenchymal or pleural lesions is that they have a long axis and a short axis. The lesion here in the left chest wall has long and short axis. This was an patient with plasma site. On the other hand, lung lesions tend to have similar axes and a round shape. As you notice here in this patient with multiple metastatic nodules and masses. Plural lesions sometimes have a sharp edge on one side and fade away on the other side. As in this patient who has a plural lipoma, that is difficult to see, particularly on the lateral view. Another sign, though strictly speaking not a radiographic sign, is that lung lesions tend to replace and destroy the lung parenchyma, whereas pleural and extraparenchymal lesions tend to push away and displace lung parenchyma and masses. We're going to look at the following pleural diseases on Simple pleural effusions tend to gravitate downwards, and they also have a meniscus sign at the edge of the chest wall, and they're freely mobile on different positions. This is a patient with a small right pleural effusion, and on lying in the decubitus position with the right side down, the fluid layers indicating that it's mobile. This is another patient on CT, showing freely flowing pleural fluid 
which makes a meniscus sign and gravitates to a dependent location, indicating that it's mobile. This is another patient with a large right pleural effusion on the frontal and lateral views. And on the lateral decubitus view, right side down, there's free layering of this pleural effusion, indicating that it's not loculated or localized. Here is another patient with a large right pleural effusion on the frontal and lateral view. And on decubitus positioning, there's no change in the configuration of this large right pleural effusion, indicating that it's loculated or localized and prevented from moving freely. This is the last patient we just saw showing that large right pleural effusion, which is localized or loculated. It has a thickened visceral and parietal pleura, the split pleural sign in empyema. When it comes to sizing pleural effusions, this patient has a small left pleural effusion on the frontal view. However, on the lateral view, you'll notice there's quite a sizable pleural effusion. It's possible to hide 250 to 300 mils in the costophrenic recess before it becomes visible on the frontal view. This patient has a subpulmonic pleural effusion. The fluid is underneath the right lung in this case. This can simulate an elevated hemidiaphragm, but one thing to notice is that the dome of the apparent elevated hemidiaphragm is displaced more naturally. There tends to be a gradual medial slope and then a more sharp lateral slope to the subpulmonic pleural effusion. You can see the subpulmonic pleural effusion on the lateral view below the lung. This is another patient with a pleural effusion on the left side. And this pleural effusion is localized in the upper aspect of the left major fissure. We can distinguish it from a mass by its density. It's not so dense. There's also overlay sign where we can see lung vessels coursing through it. It's also sharply marginated in keeping with fluid in the fissure. And it also has a long axis and a short axis, unlike a lung parenchymal mass. This is the so-called pseudotumor. Sometimes it's referred to as cigar sign because of its shape. This is the same patient on CT, confirming that it's fluid attenuation and that it's aligned along the left major fissure. You'll also notice they have central nodules due to endobronchial spread of infection. This is an ill elderly lady who is not improving on antibiotic treatment for pneumonia. There's an ill-defined opacity of the left hemithorax and also a moderate left pleural effusion. On the lateral view, we see that there's an extra parenchymal opacity that makes an obtuse angle with the left chest wall. It's not very easy to see on this radiograph. She had a CT to evaluate, and the CT with contrast shows a left pleural effusion with thickening of the overlying visceral and parietal pleura on the coronal and the sagittal images, we can see that extra parenchymal opacity that makes up two angles with the left chest wall. She also had a small right pleural effusion, which was more simple with a, a gravitational location and also a meniscus sign. This is a patient who was on anticoagulation treatment. He became acutely short of breath and chest radiograph shows a large right pleural effusion. One thing to notice is that this is quite dense, increased in attenuation. This patient had a non contrast CT, which shows the large right pleural effusion. The axial and the sagittal images show dependent layering of high attenuation hematocrit in this patient with no thorax. CT with contrast can be used to look for. This is a rare complication of a pleural effusion that is difficult to diagnose clinically. This patient has a large left pleural effusion and the asterisk here is indicating the gastric air bubble, which is displaced downwards. This is indicating that the diaphragm is depressed downwards. This is the same patient after relief of the pleural effusion with thoracentesis, showing the stomach bubble rising to its usual location. Side-by-side side radiographs before and after thoracentesis show 
the difference in the positioning of the gastric air bubble. It's very important to be able to diagnose this because clinically it's hard to diagnose and it's associated with uh, diaphragmatic paradoxical movement and uh, difficult uh, gas exchange in respiration. It's very important for radiologists to pick this up. It's a rare finding though. This is another patient with pleural opacification and in trying to decide whether it's thickening or effusion, we look for the meniscus sign. But in this case, there's a sharp costophrenic angle. However, there is pleural opacification. And on the lateral view, if there was fluid in the pleural space, we would expect that to gravitate downwards, which it is not doing. So this was consistent with pleural thickening. Some of you may notice there's a subtle decrease in the size of the left hemithorax relative to the right, which can happen with chronic pleural thickening. Sometimes pleural plaques can calcify, as in this patient with holly leaf calcified pleural plaques. These are bilateral calcified pleural plaques, which can be seen in the setting of previous asbestos exposure. Typical locations include upon the hemidiaphragms and also in the medial aspect of the chest. This is a patient with extensive calcification of the pleural space on the left known as fibrothorax. You'll notice the decrease in volume of the left hemithorax, and they have CT with lung window, uh, bone window settings, and soft tissue window settings showing calcification of the visceral and parietal pleura. Fibrothorax can result from previous hemothorax or from empyema with histoplasmosis or tuberculosis infection. When evaluating for pneumothorax, we usually look for a pleural edge and the lack of lung vessels beyond. But another sign to look for is the mediastinal position. Normally, the mediastinum is centered so that one to two fifths lies to the right of the midline, the midline being the spinous processes of the thoracic spine. Notice in this radiograph, which is relatively well centered, the mediastinum is to the left. Whereas one day previously, it was better centered. This can be a sign, mediastinal displacement of a tension pneumothorax. Some of you will also notice that this left hemidiaphragm is also crisp and easy to see, which can be a sign of a small left anterior basilar pneumothorax. In the supine position, air can gather in the left anterior basilar pleural space. This is another patient who had a deep sulcus sign. And we can't always rely on seeing the pleural edge, particularly in the supine patients in the air. Air gathers in the uh, anterior inferior pleural space, which is the uh, high up in the supine patient. This is a large right pneumothorax with deep sulcus sign and also displacement of the mediastinal structures to the left, consistent with tension pneumothorax. This is a medical emergency. Neural opacifications can result from many causes. This was incidentally found in an emergency room patient, and it makes obtuse angles with the chest wall, and there is no bone destruction. This patient had a CT performed, which is a heterogeneous mass that makes obtuse angles with the chest. This turned out to be a benign pleural uh, fibroma and it was resected because of the uh, risk of transformation to malignancy. Solitary fibrous tumors can be quite mobile and soft, and they often have an appearance like this draped over the chest wall. Most pleural implants arise from metastatic lesions from cancers elsewhere as opposed to pleural neoplasm. This was a patient with metastatic sarcoma and they had a large left chest wall mass but they also have pleural implants on the left side and also pulmonary nodules and masses. This is the pulmonary nodule on the lateral view. They had a CT with contrast performed that shows the left chest wall mass but also on the coronal view we can see the pleural implants and we can also see the lung nodule as well. This was a patient with metastatic ovarian cancer with a large left pleural effusion causing displacement of mediastinal structures to the right 
they also have lung nodules bilaterally, but notice that the pleural effusion and thickening has a nodular configuration consistent with implants. This is their initial CT on the top row with contrast, showing nodules, implants along the left pleura with the large left pleural effusion. Three months later, they have a non-contrast CT. This shows progression in the pleural thickening, which is also extending over the mediastinal aspect and into the fissures with nodular uh, acidies there and also extension through the left chest. This patient had mesostatic pyloma. On the left is the original thymic lesion and on the right side, chest radiograph from three years later, showing recurrence with extra parenchymal or pleural implants on the right side. This is a CT in the same patient with the thymoma, CT with contrast showing pleural implants bilaterally, causing extra parenchymal masses, making up two cents known pleural interface. Pleural metastases most commonly result from cancers of the lung, stomach, breast, thymus, and this was a patient with progressive shortness of breath over a couple of years. He had worked in the building industry in the past and was exposed to asbestos. The left hemithorax is reduced in volume, and this is a characteristic of mesothelioma. There's also nodular pleural thickening that extends over the medial aspect as well as laterally. This patient had a CT performed, which shows nodular pleural thickening that also extends over the mediastinal surface. It extends into the pleural fissures and also there's lymph node enlargement in the mediastinal. On this coronal view, you'll notice a decrease in the size of the hemithorax. I'm going to stop here and just summarize to say that chest radiography is useful in the evaluation of the pleura. By distinguishing pleural disease from lung parenchymal disease, we can narrow the differential diagnosis. Find the physics of fluid, air, and gravity can help us assess. And remember pleural disease features, such as the angle that it makes with the chest wall, the shape with the long and short axis, the margins, usually well demarcated, and features such as displacement of lung and vessels. Thank you very much for your time and attention. And I'd be happy to take any questions or comments. My email is enclosed below also for comments. Thank you once again.